Welcome back. We'll now proceed to our first panel. The goal of this panel is to discuss the adequacy of our current financial regulatory framework. A decade ago, Congress passed and President Obama signed the Dodd-Frank Act, which was designed to substantially reform the US financial regulatory system in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. Last year, we witnessed the first economic shock to the financial system since the enactment of Dodd-Frank, which makes this the appropriate time to assess whether the act lived up to its promises. We're fortunate today to have three former congressional staffers who all played a major role in Congress's consideration of the Dodd-Frank Act to give their insights on the legacy of the bill. Our panel consists of Mike Pivovar, who is the executive director of the Milken Institute Center for Financial Markets. He is a former SEC commissioner and acting chair. He was the Republican chief counsel, or sorry, Republican chief economist at the Senate Banking Committee during Dodd-Frank. Kevin Edgar is counsel at Baker Hostelletter. He is the former chief counsel at the House Financial Services Committee. Jonah Crane is a partner at the Claros Group. He is the former counsel to Senator Charles Schumer and served as the uh, deputy assistant secretary for financial stability at the US Treasury Department. So um, I'm going to start in by asking a question for to all, all three of you, which is, which is you know, Dodd-Frank to enhance the financial stability of the United States with a series of reform, very broad reforms, including creating several new regulatory bodies, such as the CFPB, the FSOC, sought to reform bank regulation and derivatives markets, establishing a new resolution authority, and new lending rules for mortgages, amongst other reforms. You know, in light of last year's economic downturn, you know, which provisions of Dodd-Frank actually did live up to its promise of enhancing financial stability uh, of the uh, enhancing the financial stability of the United States, as opposed to just talking about the act as a whole? You know, I'm interested in your views about let, let's talk first about specific provisions. Um, uh, Mike, why don't I start with you? You know, where do you where do you actually think the act held up well? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, I think I think one of the provisions in Dodd Frank, one of the titles is uh, Title Seven, the over the counter uh, derivatives uh, provisions, right? And although I have some um, serious concerns about some of the very specifics uh, of that title, the one thing that it did do was it provided regulatory transparency in the over the counter swaps markets. If you think back to the global financial crisis, one of the reasons why the government had to step in in so many different ways is simply because the regulators had no idea what the true exposures were in this market. Um, you know, I was working at the White House at the time and part of my job was to try to figure out who was the next one to go after we had Bear Stearns. And we were looking at all the regulatory reports, SEC required filings, the bank regulatory requiring filings. And prior to Dodd-Frank, no one was um, permitted, it, it, the regulatory agencies were actually prohibited by law from having uh, information about the exposures uh, in, in the over-the-counter market. And so we had surprises like AIG, where we had a lot of the big banks were exposed on one side of credit default swap. So I think if, you know, if, you know, I've been, been a, you know, very, very critical of many things of Dodd-Frank, we'll probably get into it. But I say, I think one of the, the things that did work, um, the extent that, um, that we could see in this crisis was that um, the over-the-counter reporting, uh, the reporting of over-the-counter derivatives positions gave confidence and comfort, not only to the regulators, uh, but to market participants that there weren't hidden uh, counterparty risks uh, this time around. Uh, Kevin, do you, do you agree with that assessment? Or do you have other areas of Dodd-Frank that you think actually held up pretty well? Yeah, thanks for having me, Andrew. So I, I, I would agree with Mike. I also think that uh, there, there were components of Title I uh, in terms of the enhanced prudential authorities that, that uh, were given out worked. And certainly the regulators' ability to exercise organic authority that they have and maybe were reluctant to or didn't feel that they uh, uh, could use it, uh, those powers certainly came to light last year. Um, and the flexibility that that regulators were attempting to provide regulated entities certainly um, uh, helped. Um, but because this was not a lending crisis last year, right? It was a broad economic crisis. Um, Dodd Frank is not a not a hundred percent applicable to what to what we experienced last uh, March and April. 
Jonah, Jonah, what do you think? You know, in terms of the statute, you know, on the other side, you're on the other side of the aisle and the staff. Uh, did Dodd Frank live up to all the promises uh, that you thought at the time, and in particular, which areas uh, of the what provisions of the bill do you think actually worked pretty well last year? Yeah, thanks, Andrew, and thanks uh, to Federalist Society for inviting me to join this this timely conversation with some former colleagues. So I res respect a tremendous deal. Um, as Kevin notes, I think this is a you know an, an interesting crisis to you know through which to think about Dodd Frank because it, it's not a crisis that started in the financial sector. Um, and, you know, for various reasons might be, might be thought of as, you know, per, perhaps not the best, um, stress test on which to hinge, uh, definitive conclusions about the, the, the stability of the financial system, um, partly because, you know, the government support and response to the pandemic was so overwhelming. Now I happen to think that's a very good thing. Um, and, uh, you know, nonetheless, the fact is you know, consumer delinquencies went down in the beginning of the crisis, not up, right? All kinds of things that, you know, with unemployment at 15%, you would have expected a lot more stress on the banking system. That said, you know, let's not be uncharitable. Um, the banking system came into this crisis with more than double the, the levels of capital that mm -hmm. it entered the financial crisis in 2008 with. And that was, uh, I think, proved, proved important. And you saw regulators at the beginning of this crisis urge banks to draw down their capital buffers to continue lending to consumers and businesses. And I think that was all part of an important response to the pandemic that helped to put some real support under, uh, you know, under the economy at a critical time. So I, I think, I think um, on the capital and prudential uh, measures, um, you know, pretty high marks. I think I would echo Mike in saying that Title VII seemed to have worked well. I mean, this was a difficult crisis with at the outset, some real financial market um, uh, volatility, and we didn't see any, um, you know, any real blowups in some of the corners of the markets where we did before. I think the, in addition to the transparency Mike highlighted, I think the, the sort of robust infrastructure and central clearing uh, that was put in place following the prior crisis seemed to have worked well in those markets. And there are probably lessons. Maybe we can get into this. There are probably lessons for some other markets that we could uh, that we could think about. So I think on the whole, those are the two areas I'd look at in response to this crisis and. Uh, and I think on, 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 in those areas, Dodd-Frank performed, uh, performed well, although um, perhaps a, a grade of incomplete, as it were, given the, the unique nature of this crisis. Now, you know, Kevin, you know, I think I want to follow up on something you said, which is, you know, certainly I think acro across the, the aisle, there's a recognition, ten, you know, 10 years ago that bank capital needed to move up. And we've seen that over the ensuing 10 years. And that seems like a, a, there's been a strong um, uh, agreement uh, amongst regulators, Congress, private sector, the capital had to, had to increase. But uh, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your comment about whether or not it was actually Dodd-Frank that was responsible for the increase in capital as opposed to regulators who already had that authority on their own uh, moving up capital and also market forces moving up capital. You know, how much would you attribute it to Dodd Frank that that success? So it's a it's a good question. Uh, certainly, the Fed always had the ability to set capital, and they did so at, with their international counterparts. And we've all, uh, at least uh, those of us that were still uh, in Congress following the enactment of Dodd Frank, kept being told. Well, remember, there's there's two sets of stress tests. There's the Dodd Frank mandated stress test, and then there's the Federal Reserve mandated stress test. So we knew that the Fed had authorities that they could exercise. Act, frankly, all the regulators had regulators had authorities that they could exercise. Uh, probably with the exception of the uh, of the Title VII derivatives markets, which were uh, uh, new authorities. So. We always knew that that the banking regulators had a great amount of had a great amount of organic authority mm -hmm. to tell their regulated entities, here is what you must do, here are our expectations. Whether they exercised it or not is an, is another question. Uh, uh, and then uh, where there were, uh, I don't want to say, uh, where, where there were maybe potentially holes. Those were filled by Dodd Frank, particularly Title VII, possibly Title IV, with the the, over, the oversight to the SEC of private uh, advisors to private funds, a few other areas. Um, 
uh, clearly Title II was 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 an area that 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 some perceived as a whole and the need to have a, a, a single resolution system. But you know there were there were criticisms at least sitting where I was sitting that that you had authority you didn't use it why didn't you use it uh, why do you need more authority are we just going to uh, give give regulators more and more authority that they clearly aren't going to use. So those were that was that was also that was a at least sitting in the House Republican minority at the time that was a that was a challenge that we were always thinking about. Yeah. So let's move in into some of the more uh, more critiques uh, of the statute. Then, Mike, you know, as you look back now, you know, what do you think were the the real flaws of Dodd Frank and the the problems aspects and you know the, your critiques at the time? Do you think they've they've held up well? Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, some things are too early to tell, right? So Kevin mentioned, you know, Title II orderly liquidation authority. Some of us still have concerns that um, that that's not going to work. We just don't know at this point. We haven't had a large failure of a bank. And, and you know, one of the things that's remarkable in this crisis is, as, as Jonah pointed out, the bank capital levels were much higher. And it's, you know, you can look at it, you know, in this crisis, you know, banks were part of the solution, not part of the problem, right? They were the ones that were implementing the PPP program and some of the other things. And as Kevin pointed out, you know, a large part of that was was not due to Dodd Frank. It was it was authorities that the, that the regulators already had. And one of my frustrations was the fact that, you know, during Dodd Frank, there was this huge emphasis put on so-called so macro prudential regulation. I always viewed that in large part as the regulatory agencies trying to divert attention from the fact that they didn't do their micro prudential regulation correctly. And I think there were there were there were gaps in terms of using their their existing authority. In terms of Dodd Frank provisions that have that have shown to be um, particularly problematic, I think in in this last crisis, as as Jonah pointed out, we had the fragility of some markets where the Federal Reserve had to to come in. Uh, and I would point to the Volcker Rule, and this was something that many of us had concerns with, right? So the purpose of the of the Volcker Rule was to make bank balance sheets safer, and in fact, they did. What they did was they took off of the bank balance sheet some risky activities, proprietary trading, and investing in in covered funds, but by doing so, by making the bank safer, remember that the banks um, prior to Dodd-Frank were the traditional providers of liquidity. They were the big dealers, the big traders in these markets, and their balance sheets provided sort of shock absorbers for these particular markets. And so when this crisis comes along, the banks have now, because of, because of um, uh, the Volcker rule, have had to pull back in so many different markets. Not only in this crisis did, they, did the Fed and Treasury reopen the credit facilities they did in the last crisis, they actually had to extend them into markets that they've never had to intervene in before. The corporate bond market, the municipal bond market, for example. And so I think what this crisis shows is that, they're, they're, that, the, that the Volcker rule has had some unintended uh, consequences. Uh, Kevin, what do you what do you think? If you're, if you're going to critique the the act, looking back on it, you know which 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 provision do you think didn't hold up here? I would have to clearly agree with Mike on on Volcker. That was a concern that we all had, and and you know, here's how I look at it: if 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 that's all that Dodd Frank was was a single provision, we could have a a, a debate. But there were so many, uh, and some of those are in conflict with each other and why we needed to make uh, changes, um, you know, I, it's hard to say what, what has worked. I would agree with Mike as well. Title II has not, we don't know because it hasn't been used, but there have been examples of institutions that have had to go through a bankruptcy or a liquidation process. Uh, MF Global to be to use as one example through the SIPIC process that's worked and worked well. Um, so there are there are there are tested events that we've we've been able to look at and there has not been a a major shock. Um, uh, there's not been a, a destabilizing event, uh, but there are there are still some provisions that that. We we continue to want to fix or had had tried to fix even even after, because we knew that they were problematic. Um, they they haven't uh, been able to get across the finish line yet. I think the the uh, provisions into non bank designations may not have been um, the best. Um, 
because we keep having these debates about who should be in and who should be out. Um, but so many of the provisions of the bill just haven't really, some of them haven't even really been used yet, uh, uh, let alone Title II. There, there, are, there are plenty of provisions that, that have not been used. Uh, so we, we go back and say, what was the need for them? Uh, uh, are they there just to be a standby provisions? If, if they are, maybe it's time to, 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 to take a look at some of those again as well. Yeah. Jonah, let me follow up on that. Is, you know, is, you know, is, it was remarked, you know, the, the, the Fed did have to create a, a whole series of new emergency liquidity facilities. I think when Dodd-Frank was passed, you know, there was a hope that uh, financial stability would be en enhanced enough that, um, uh, that kind of the next shot time there was a shock the Fed wouldn't resort to use, you have, having to use those facilities, it's 13.3 uh, authority. Now, certainly it was still there in case, you know, you never know the size of the shock and it was it was a uh, uh, important tool to still have in the toolbox. But there certainly is a hope that the regulatory system would be stronger and would hopefully not, not need to use it. The fact that, you know, a mere 10 years later, we're back to having the Fed uh, deploy significant liquidity facilities. Do you, you know, what's your view of that? Is that show that the act wasn't successful in in, um, uh, in 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 improving its financial stability, in the U.S. or is that part of the normal operation of the bill? Yeah, I think. I mean, <clears throat> for starters, I think as you said, it, it's you know I don't want to overstate um, the problems in terms of the Fed's facilities here. The Fed is the lender of last resort in our economy. I think it's an appropriate role for them. And, you know, I, for one, um, was not uh, super enthusiastic about restraining the Fed's 13-3 authorities. I think it's an important authority to have as a backstop. That said, I think if you look at um, the way that the Fed stepped in at the beginning of this crisis and the reasons that they stepped in, and Mike alluded to some of these, there are, there are some reasons to really think hard about uh, what was happening there. And the Fed stepped in really to support market functioning. And, um, you know, I, I do think we should be concerned when, you know, some of the most important markets in the U.S. and indeed the world um, are ceasing to function properly. And we're talking about short term funding markets that are critical to in the Treasury market. They're critical to everyday funding for corporations, et cetera. Um, so I think there are a couple things to think about there and I'll try and just tick them off. Um, one. I do think, you know, when I was at Treasury, we were looking really hard at the potential impact of regulation and other factors on market liquidity. And it was hard to draw any real direct parallels between regulatory reforms such as Volcker and what we were seeing in terms of market liquidity. There was a structural transformation in many markets, and that would include the corporate bond markets here, which is relevant for a discussion around the Fed's responses last year. Um, in terms of a transition away from dealer oriented markets towards, um, you know, sort of more transparent uh, markets facilitated with by more electronic trading. Um, so less of a dealer focused intermediation and more of uh, sort of all to all kind of trading. And uh, the reality of those markets um, as markets transition in, in that way, which has happened in other markets over over time, um, is that liquidity, you know, looks better on a day to day basis and then in a, in a, in a crisis can go away rapidly. And um, so I think there's that dynamic that, that regulators do need to get their arms around in some markets, including the treasury market. And those were, those were issues we were looking at closely when I was at treasury. There is one you know, aspect of the regulatory reforms that's worth pausing on, and it's a, it's a small one. I think it gets a lot of attention, mm -hmm. um, and I think the impacts are, are possibly larger than, um, than even the, the market disruptions last spring. And that's the, the, the leverage ratio and the fact that you know, the leverage ratio has become, I think, a more binding constraint or more frequently binding constraint than was anticipated when it was adopted. And that's true, not just for the largest banks, but for lots of banks. Um, uh, and the reason is, uh, you know, we didn't really anticipate that the Fed would be maintaining a really large balance sheet for a very long time when the leverage ratio was put in place. And when the Fed has a large balance sheet, it means banks have lots of reserves. And when those reserves are counted against your leverage ratio, the leverage ratio quickly becomes binding. And I think that's part of what was happening last spring. I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's the full story by any stretch, but um, it's still with us. And, you know, there's still a crunch um, in the financial system where banks are reluctant to take on deposits. So I think there's some interesting cascading effects that I would think about uh, looking at there and recalibrating um, to avoid some of the un unintended consequences. My final point, just super quickly, is, you know, Mike mentioned the micro versus macro prudential debate. 
And I, I sort of come out on the opposite side here, looking at the last crisis. I mentioned how regulators, you know, urge banks to draw down their um, their excess capital at the beginning of the crisis and use it to lend. Um, I think that combined with a lot of research that was done following the last financial crisis, um, which shows that financial crises are, um, you know, not necessarily predicted by bank capital levels, but are predicted by uh, lending booms and credit booms, uh, suggests to me that some counter cyclical policy that could um, push against credit booms on the one hand and um, you know ease up during a crisis on the other could be could be uh, could be helpful. They are difficult to implement, um, and I think Kevin has raised some good questions about why regulators haven't uh, always used the flexibility that they already have. But that's uh, that's one area I would think about. Uh, in the wake of uh, the pandemic, what, what about money market funds? Uh, you mentioned you know short-term funding. You know this is an area that um, Dodd Frank you know partially partially addressed. Do you think it's an area they they got right um, uh, in light of what happened last year? Uh, you know what's your view? Like this is a good example, I think, of what Kevin was talking about. I think there's ample authority to deal with uh, the issues that have been presented again and again at this point by money market funds. There were multiple attempts by the SEC in 2010 and then again in 2014. You know, when I was at Treasury, we were we were a bit concerned about um, some of the some of the elements of the 2014 reforms, in particular the potential for um, essentially, essentially redemption gates or fees that um, you know we we thought might um, might be causes of runs on money, prime money market funds. And I think the, the, the evidence from last year suggests that, that that may have been borne out. And I think there was a good report from the president's working group um, under the Trump administration at the end of last year that suggests a path forward for some further reforms. I think further reforms in money funds would be, would be advisable. Um, I think all the authorities that they need uh, are there. And it seems like there's, you know, there was certainly um, interest in that in the previous administration. And I hope that carries over into this administration. Let's kind of continue on the line of things that they actually act didn't cover. Uh, you know, Mike, are there any other areas of reform that you think should have been in, potentially included in Dodd Frank um, that weren't? Yeah, so um, I mean, I know Kevin's going to weigh in here on a couple of these too, but so I'm going to steal a little bit from him, right? So obviously, one was um, dealing with. Um, you know, housing finance, right? You think back to the crisis, right? One of the two biggest entities to fail that required the biggest bailouts were the GSEs, and and Dodd Frank's essentially silent on that. And and we have you know more than ten years later, they're still in conservatorship, and we have um, you know more government involvement in the housing finance system than than we've ever had uh, in this particular time, right? We've yeah. you know there's some some credit risk provisions in Dodd Frank that actually gives sort of an unfair advantage to the GSEs vis-a-vis -vis the private label securities market. We haven't had um, you know sort of sort of a growth uh, to that. And the the other thing I would I would mention is it it didn't rationalize the regulatory system. Uh, one of the things that was apparent uh, in the crisis is that we you know as as Dodd himself used to call it the alphabet soup of regulators. You know all the acronyms that are out there. Um, not only did Dodd-Frank not take the opportunity to rationalize um, the regulatory system, it, it actually added more um, to the alphabet soup. Um, and it makes it more difficult for, um, for, uh, for market participants to actually, you know, go through the maze of, of financial regulation. We're seeing, you know, before, before Dodd-Frank or during Dodd-Frank, no one ever heard of financial technology or fintech industry, which would basically came about uh in, in in the aftermath of the of the global financial crisis and um and in what we're seeing is that you know there's so many innovators right now that are having trouble navigating the maze of 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 the regulations it, you know it wasn't necessarily apparent in the crisis and it's not going to be apparent in the crisis but what we're seeing is that um you know as as, as other jurisdictions are moving ahead of us on things like you know, thinking about digital assets more progressively with a small p progressively and, and cryptocurrencies and, and and central bank digital currencies and thinking about responsible innovation that improves access to capital, financial inclusion, regulatory transparency, all the things that we like. Um, by keeping this maze of regulators, we're actually stifling innovation and potentially uh, future economic growth and the competitiveness of our markets. Kevin, do you agree with that? That, that you know, at one point, you know, um, it looked like Dodd Frank was actually going to consolidate uh, uh, the regulators, um, you know, strip the Fed of its banking uh, regulatory responsibilities, and create an entirely new standalone uh, consolidated financial regulator. Ultimately, that's not what happened, and it moved towards adding additional uh, regulators, more more letters to the alphabet. 
you know, what, what's your view on, on that? You know, this is a, you know, our, our uh, fracture banking system has been around for a long time, you know? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question, Andrew. If, if I think if you had asked Mike or I, or even you, would we be um, a net four new entities? Yeah. Not, that, that might be low uh, coming out of Dodd-Frank. I don't think, or, or the crisis, I don't know if we would have agreed with or thought that was going to be the case. Um, we, we still continue to have the split market regulator system. We, we're one of the few, if only nations that have two market capital markets regulators. Um, that, that really could have been uh, addressed um, in Dodd-Frank. So we, we add, obviously we add the CFPB, we add OFR, we add the uh, Federal Insurance Office, we add the FSOC, let alone all of the, the, the new offices that were created throughout the agencies, particularly the SEC, where they added four, at least four, I think, new offices um, uh, and elevated them um, within the agency say for one, uh, to uh, uh, give the SEC uh, chairman, uh, you know, something like 23 direct reports, which is interesting. Um, so we didn't, we didn't make the, the regulatory structure simpler, which is, of course, is one of the, the, the critiques that agencies weren't talking to each other ahead of the crisis. And uh, that's why we had uh, some some of the challenges. Uh, at least we had testimony on that. Uh, I agree with Mike uh, both on the GSEs uh, as well. Um, and I'll throw in a third. There was you know we were we were sitting in a recession, and yes, the goal of Dodd Frank was to go in and, and be a, a regulatory fix to that recession, but there was nothing pro growth in the bill uh, to unleash capital or unleash markets that had that were sitting on the sideline, uh, which is why we in the in the following year, uh, uh, in 2011, started to work on capital formation initiatives resulting in the Jobs Act in, in 2012. Uh, to try to reignite a, a, a stagnant IPO and, and uh, uh, capital markets. So there were there were things that Dodd Frank could have contained. Um, uh, it didn't. I, I would agree with Mike. Probably the, the biggest uh, omission was the GSEs. You know, Jonah, why don't we follow up on that? Which is, um, you know, Kevin notes that you know, the the impact of of, of Dodd Frank on economic growth. Um, you know, we saw in the wake of Dodd Frank really a decade of slower than average e economic growth. You know, how much do you attribute to um, uh, that slower growth and job growth in particular to to Dodd Frank uh, putting a lot of new uh, costs and, and impediments on our financial system and you know, do you think that Dodd Frank overdid it at all? Um, I mean, you you have a unique position because you were both not only a senior aide at the time Dodd Frank was being drafted, but then had to go to the administration and oversee a lot of the implementation on this. So I'm curious if you think that it was it was it was too big of a load for the financial um, regulators and the executive branch to handle. No, there was no question a lot in Dodd Frank, and you know I think there was a lot in Dodd Frank for a variety of reasons, um, and you know much of Dodd Frank. You know, wasn't wasn't specifically targeted at the crisis. I think that's 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 the nature of the legislative process. And if you can if you can get politics out of the legislative process, come give me a call and we can <laughs> talk talk about some pristine academic legislation to to go construct. Um, I think I think it, it it was a lot. I you know the evidence suggests to me um, that uh, you know it's hard to pin a whole lot around regulation and regulatory reform. In terms of the the speed of the crisis, or the speed of the recovery, rather, I think there was a a book published right at the beginning of the crisis called "This Time Is Different," and mm -hmm. uh, everybody focused on the fact that you know the book talked about uh, you know debt to GDP ratios in the neighborhood of ninety percent being problematic through history, but but really the whole book was written about, and the title was was driven by the fact that the aftermath of financial crises is just bad, and, and I think there are a variety of reasons for that. Um, but, you know, if you have a, a financial system that is, you know, has been hit by, by a financial crisis and is uh, 
slowly repairing itself, it's going to you know have a difficult time supporting the broader um, economy. I think the the contrast between the levels of overall fiscal support uh, that were provided after 2008 and 9, and the, the amount of fiscal support that was provided um, in the most recent pandemic, and the, the different recovery trajectories suggest to me that there's you know a much bigger elephant in the room than um, than Dodd Frank in terms of the the appropriate policy responses here. Um, you know that said, I pick up on a couple threads that Kevin and Mike mentioned. I do think. You know, again, for better or worse, there's not a lot of evidence that regulatory structure matters all that much. Uh, the UK had a very streamlined structure and, and yet had a financial system that blew up. So it's not clear to me that getting down to a single regulator would, would make all that much difference. Um, you know, but of course, I did uh, have a role at FSOC at Treasury. And I think coordinating among that many agencies is, um, you know, suggests that there are real frictions there that. Um, you know, if you could eliminate some of those, we might uh, have more effective responses in certain areas. And I would, I would point in particular to some of the short-term funding market issues that have come up a couple times in this conversation. If you think about the repo market, the Fed has a hand both as a participant in those markets at some level and as a regulator. The SEC obviously has a role to play. There are related derivatives markets where the CFTC is the regulator and Treasury is the issuer of the primary asset used as collateral in repo markets. And so you have a whole lot of really interested stakeholders in that debate. And, you know, FSOC was formed as a group uh, that could come together and coordinate on those issues. Um, I'd say its authority is outside of single firm designation, probably uh, leave something to be desired. And if you could, you could beef up FSOC's authorities to conduct activities based reviews and, um, you know, carry out multi-agency reforms, I think uh, maybe we could maybe we could have a, a more effective response in some of these areas. But ultimately, the, the authorities exist. It's not a matter of authorities, as Kevin keeps harping on. It's, it's really the fact that you need a sense of urgency in addressing these issues. So, Mike, is our, uh, uh, is our PhD economist on the panel? You know, what, what, what's, what's your view on the impact of Dodd-Frank on, on uh, U.S. economic growth over the last decade? Yeah, so, I mean, there's there, there's there's many ways to sort of think about the costs of Dodd Frank, right? So, so obviously we've been focused on the benefits, right? So, so some of the costs are um, the direct regulatory costs on that, right? And one of the things that 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 we know is that when you impose more fixed cost of regulation uh, on a particular industry, right, that benefits the largest players and it helps keep out uh, barriers and it creates barriers to entry for more innovation and stuff. And so what we see is, you know, look in the banking sector, for example, right? It was you know, as touted as this was going to be, you know, go after Wall Street or whatever. But, you know, the big banks have done quite well because they can amortize those costs over large balance sheets. And I worry about um, how that affects competition and innovation from not, not only the banking sector, uh, but some of the other ones. But but one of the costs people don't talk about as much is is the opportunity cost of, of doing uh, a lot of these provisions. Right. So. Um, the fact that, you know, as, as, as Jonah pointed out, and you pointed out, Andrew, that, um, you know, a lot of what Dodd-Frank did was told the regulators go forth and promulgate a bunch of new rules. Um, you know, did Dodd-Frank, when it was passed, but that was only the beginning. It was it told the regulators promulgate about 400 new rules. And, you know, then I went to the SEC and we were responsible for about 100 of them on an individual or joint basis. And so what that did was that took out basically all of the bandwidth from the SEC and, and to the point where it's still some Dodd-Frank provisions still aren't done yet. Um, thank goodness, because there some of them are particularly problematic. Um, but um, but 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 what it did was it took up all the bandwidth in the SEC and the other agencies were focused on implementing Dodd-Frank. And markets change, markets evolve, right? I mentioned the fintech industry, right? There was no such thing as Bitcoin back in the day or, or other cryptocurrencies or those types of things. And we've fallen behind our regulatory framework. I worry about you know, the competitiveness of US markets and the ability to keep up and, and engage in discretionary rulemakings that keep up with the markets that are going on, right? I mean, we just had, um, you know, I just testified a, a couple months ago, twice in the, once in the House and once in the Senate on sort of the aftermath of the, the January trading frenzy uh, in GameStop and so other so-called meme stops, right? There's a lot of market structure issues that the SEC knows they need to fix, but they just have not had the opportunity to do it because their bandwidth was taken up by Dodd Frank. And so, those are those are some of the indirect costs that we need to take into account uh, with respect to Dodd Frank. And, and if I may, one other thing that Jonah brought up that I thought was particularly important was you know he mentioned it was a very political process in this in in, in the Dodd Frank. But one thing I would add to that too.
is that, you know, each of these provisions that were in Dodd-Frank were sort of, when the way it was worked through, uh, particularly on the Senate side, was that each one was sort of its own standalone thing to address a particular issue. Now, the issue may have been related to the financial crisis or the issue may have been related, you know, as Jonah points out, not everything was related, you know, in, in, in Rahm Emanuel's words, you know, don't let a crisis go to waste. But it was particularly problematic because each provision was sort of a standalone. And so you have provisions in Dodd-Frank that in many cases are redundant. So they, 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 there's additional regulatory burdens for, for the, and they're trying to accomplish the same thing. And there's even provisions in Dodd-Frank that, that, are, that work across purposes. So for example, in the credit rating agency provisions, right? there's the Lemieux Amendment, which is trying to decrease the regulatory reliance on credit ratings. And then there was the Franken Amendment that actually does the opposite and sort of inserts in there an SEC role for, you know, picking who's going to rate different uh, asset backed security stuff. Now, luckily, that got beaten back in, in, in the conference on Dodd-Frank to just a study. And thank goodness, Al Franken's, you know, his only legislative accomplishment was only a study. So uh, we were able to beat that back. But, you know, take it as a, if you look at Dodd-Frank as a whole, right, you, this, you know, this is, you know, the, the proverbial sausage being made and stuff. It's, it's messy. It doesn't work together as a whole complete document. Yeah, you know, that's, that's been one of the big critiques, which is why, you know, it's interesting that, you know, over the last decade, there have been so many kind of judicial challenges to Dodd-Frank. We've seen um, FSOC uh, overturn the designation of an insurance company. You know, most recently, we've seen um, the Supreme Court strike down one of, the, I think, one of the key um, points of dispute on the structure of the CFPB. And then we also saw uh, Congress come in with a, a whole series of changes that improved the tailoring of the, of the Dodd-Frank Act. And, you know, Kevin, you are a key part of that process in getting uh, S-2155 passed. Um, you know, Kevin, how about for you, I'm curious to know, like, two questions here is, one, do you think those reforms, um, uh, particularly S-2155, you know, has, what impact has it had on the resiliency of our, our banking system? Um, and did it actually help uh, the United States, you know, weather our economic storm last year better? And then two is, you know, given all the reforms that we've seen um, and core key challenges, which I think were well known at the time, you know, was this a case of where a bipartisan agreement could have been actually had, had uh, there have been a little bit more um, bipartisan nature to the, the bill? Because if you see some of the biggest areas of dispute have actually been overturned by the courts. Mm -hmm. Those are two great questions. Um, S-2155 certainly gave back flexibility that Title I took away mm -hmm. um, and said not all banks are the same um, and, that, and there's very different levels of activity between a globally systemically important bank, the largest institutions in the U.S., and someone only at 100 billion in assets. Mm -hmm. And S2155 made that, made that clear and uh, said, no, we, we have to look at a bank's individual profile and, and how they are operating and in which, which markets they are operating. And so it was very important, but I would even broaden it out, Andrew. Yeah. Um, uh, there were amendments made to Dodd-Frank as early as 2010, as you and I and Mike, uh, don't all remember had to have a couple of amendments immediately. We That's then right. moved, we, and 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 there was never a comprehensive uh, technical corrections bill really until you got to twenty one fifty five. Although not every provision was related, but in, you know immediately we 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 had troubles with implementation of the Collins Amendment. There were troubles with the derivatives title. There were. Um, uh, other inconsistencies throughout Dodd Frank that we needed to fix, and you know, if, if you take any of the fixes to the derivatives title, there's been no degradation in oversight. There's been no there's been no blow up in the in the markets. And uh, to the the earlier point that was made is you know what what was Dodd Frank directed at? In a lot of cases, it, it might have been the theme is we have to rein in Wall Street. But the users, the consumers, the customers, and investors were the ultimate uh, uh, groups that were affected by the bill. Mm 
Uh, and so we were able to make some amendments, uh, very smart amendments. They were bipartisan uh, uh, to some of the more problematic uh, provisions. Um, and none of them have, have brought about a, a, uh, a crisis uh, or a degradation in authorities or, or the ability for a regulator to continue to use uh, what Congress gave them in their creating statute. Um, uh, as for the legal challenges, to Mike's point, Dodd-Frank was just the beginning, and then you turned over uh, from Congress 400 plus rules to the executive branch and independent agencies, and it goes to your, what is your theory of the executive and their ability to act? Uh, and we saw uh, challenges to rules on arbitrary and capricious mm -hmm. grounds. We saw challenges to rules on cost benefit analysis, um, uh, just exceeding authorities, uh, that, that, that a regulator may, uh, may not have had. Um, and uh, the, the, the problem was, had, had Dodd-Frank been a little bit more bipartisan, and I can give you an example, that uh, had the Bureau uh, title and Title II been more bipartisan, had there been a bankruptcy component, maybe we could have gotten to a better place on some of the other provisions that may not have required so many amendments. Or maybe we could have gotten to a place where uh, some of the, those very late night, uh, last night of the Dodd-Frank conference provisions uh, that came in with little to no debate may have been able to been written uh, better, uh, written a little more smartly, given the, given the regulatory agencies a little more direction uh, rather than leaving very broad uh, provisions open to uh, interpretation. Yeah. Mike, do you agree with that? you think there could have been a bipartisan deal looking back on all the reforms that have actually ultimately been made either by the courts or by the Congress or by the agencies? Yeah, I mean, I mean, Andrew, I mean, you were there, right? With, I mean, we saw in the Senate, right? That we, we worked very closely with with Chairman Dodd's team. We we both worked for Senator Shelby, the ranking member on the committee, and there was there was a lot of agreement, uh, I think, on a, on a number of different issues. But then, um, you know, as as Jonah said, you know, politics got involved, right? The in the Senate, they had exactly sixty members for the supermajority, and so what that meant was that each particular member of the Democratic of the Democratic Senate had basically veto power over everything and they also had the ability to 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 add additional things in there it was the proverbial sort of christmas tree on that and then we also saw you know trying to work with the administration there were those in the administration in 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 the treasury department who um were more amenable to potentially uh you know a bipartisan bill but we also had you know there were some politicals in the white house that saw this as you know some 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 good wedge issues on these things and so um, you know, you know, thinking back to all the, you know, the machinations of this thing back and forth, um, you know, I, 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 you know, I still think of it as a missed opportunity, right? If you look at the history of the Senate Banking Committee, the most impactful, the most long, the most robust, the most, you know, sustainable type of legislation that goes through there was done on a bipartisan basis, right? And, you know, prior to Dodd-Frank, you know, Shelby and Dodd got together on the Credit Reform Act, right? And did some much, much needed, um, Hard, uh, yep. things on that so um you know it's it, it, there, there was an opportunity that was there it was unfortunate that it just got it just kept getting further and further to the left jonah what, what do you think do you think it would have been looking back now that if you could have got you know given up a few of the provisions that ultimately you lost anyways due to court challenges or other or subsequent congressional action that it would be better to get a bipartisan deal well, if that was the bid and the ask, sure, but I don't. I'm, I'm not. I'm not confident <laughs> that that's that's where we were at, right? I mean, I think the the amendments that you're talking about and the court cases have been, uh, you know, pretty close to the edges of Dodd Frank in some ways. Obviously, the the one involving the CFPB and the direct the, the structure of the CFPB is a is a is, is a big deal on the one hand. On the other hand, you know, there was a bill that Democrats fully supported coming out of the House with a very different CFPB. So that's right. Um, you know, we had a we had a commission structure. So I think. And he had told me that, you know, Dodd-Frank was going to pass with, you know, the provisions of the tailoring of S-2155 instead of, you know, the slightly uh, different tailoring uh, provisions that were in, in Title I of the original Dodd-Frank. I, 
I don't think anybody would have would have uh, 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 blushed. I, you know, I personally don't, uh, you know, get all that worked up about um, the changes in S twenty one fifty five, at least as it relates to the tailoring. So I think if that was the bid, bid in the ask, sure. Um, I, I think the big question is, you know, could we have gotten a real CFPB with a big bipartisan bill? Could we have gotten, um, you know, the kinds of derivatives forms, reforms we wanted? And you know. I don't know. It's an interesting hypothetical, um, but I think those would have been those would have been the two um, the two deal breakers for sure, at least from my perspective. But I wasn't, you know, I was I was working for Schumer. He was not uh, he was not chair or ranking member on the committee at the time, so I wasn't quite as close as Mike and others were to those to those debates. Hey, well, hey, uh, Andrew, sure. can I just add something real quick? Sure, so, so Jonah brings up a good point, right? The original structure for the CFPB was, was a commission. In fact, that was Elizabeth Warren's uh, first idea, the for the Consumer Financial Product Commission, right? And it wasn't that that, that Republicans were against, you know, sort of consolidating existing authorities because a lot of these authorities were spread across the different agencies. Again, one of the you know one of the things that was nice was sort of consolidate that it was. But, you know, Republicans put forth, you know, a, a concerted effort to say, look, we, we would, they would support a commission. Uh, and, they, and then two other things. Um, one was put it a subject to appropriation so Congress could have some uh, a check on it. So it wouldn't be just, you know, skimming off of the Fed and sort of having its own uh, little uh, you know, pot of money uh, to come from there, too. And the other was to have a safety and soundness check from the prudential regulators, right, to make sure that whatever this, whatever the, this consumer protection agency or whatever it was going to be, was not operating in isolation. It had to take into account safety and soundness. Checks. Those were all reasonable sort of bipartisan things. And so, um, you know, to answer- The reason they didn't get done though, Mike, just as another alternative way to view this though, is that, yeah, in many ways, the differences were just a couple of key sections of the bill, but they represented a really big different uh, vision and, and, and of uh, interpretation of the constitution really, right? On the one hand, you have kind of the progressive view of having independent agencies handle financial regulation, kind of take Congress out of the game. As you remember, that was a big part of the, of the Bureau versus a more constitutional perspective where you have um, the executive branch more directly both accountable to the Congress, through the appropriations and through accountability through the president and the unitary executive vision. And that those two visions at the end of the day, there was just no reconciliation reconciling them and parties have different viewpoints and they vote accordingly. And, you know, that's, um, that's how our democracy works. There's no problem with the fact that we didn't get, there wasn't a deal there as a result, because they're both being consistent with their, kind of, uh, with their, uh, what they think is the best ideological approach to the issue. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, so the, so the appropriations and congressional, congressional hook on this, right. Accountability. I mean, one of the things where there was agreement, right. If you think about, you know, the SEC is subject to uh, congressional appropriations, unlike yep. some of the banking agencies. And the SEC wanted its own, um, you know, to be separated from that. Um, the appropriators didn't like that. And actually, you know, Shelby, our office worked closely with Jonah and Senator Schumer's office on um, on, on reforming what the SEC uh, could do in terms of its budget, uh, giving them more flexibility to have conversations with Congress in terms of you know, not only what the passback budget was from OMB after they submitted it to the to the president, but also what their original sort of bid was um, uh, for that, and have more of those of those conversations. That it actually hardwired into the act um, additional appropriations going forward for I forget three, four, or five years, whatever it was. So, um, you know, those those are those are big issues. But you know, in, in that specific case of the SEC, those were solvable. Um, so, I, I would put forth that maybe we could have solved them in the consumer side too. Yeah, potentially. I mean, um, that that'll be the one of the great uh, unknown, unknown questions. So, well, listen, we're almost we're almost out of time here. Maybe I'll just kind of end with one kind of last uh, kind of question, and I'll I'll aim it at Jonah. And you, you each can respond. Is just kind of quickly is, you know, one other critique I think we can look back at the Dodd Frank Act is 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 if we look at all the innovation which we've mentioned here. Um, you have the rise of, uh, of digital assets, you know, fintech, artificial in intelligence, a real technological change to financial regulatory stru structure is kind of emerging. And in many ways, it looks like Dodd-Frank is kind of the, potentially the last of a bill that builds on kind of the old framework. And in a way did not, you know, qu question for you, Joan, is, you know, did Dodd-Frank kind of, in a way, miss what was coming? And now and it's, uh, we've actually got a, uh, the bill really was kind of retrospective and not prospective in what were going to be the issues going forward. 
And now we've got a regulatory system that's going to have to catch up to all these new technological innovations. Yeah, I mean, look, clearly, Dodd-Frank, uh, you know, and those of us working on it at the time did not anticipate uh, where we would be in 2021 from a fintech uh, perspective. I mean, the iPhone was barely three years old when it was passed, not even two years old when we started yeah. debating Dodd-Frank. Um, and, you know, much of the financial innovation that, you know, we see in our daily lives now uh, was... I think Mike was still using his BlackBerry at the time, if I remember during the conference. So. I, I but, still use a BlackBerry to this day. <laughs> Uh, exactly. So I, I do, I will say, I remember that Lending Club and Prosper at the time, they were, they were, you know, they were pretty nascent companies at the time and they were lobbying for an exemption from the securities laws to be able to issue mm -hmm. notes essentially, um, and call them something other than notes and have them not be subject to the securities laws. And I, I think it's, I think it's probably a good thing that Congress, um, you know, didn't uh, go down that path. Uh, on the other hand, it was probably a good signal that, Hey, something's coming here. There's a whole, you know, wave of potential innovation that may may not fit neatly within our regulatory framework, and maybe we should think a little bit harder about that. So, in retrospect, certainly a bit of a missed opportunity. I think we had, you know, a shot at dealing with some of that in the Jobs Act, and there were there were some crowdfunding provisions, which, you know, my estimation didn't end up in a great place. Um, mm -hmm. You know, mostly for reasons that I think Mike would agree with, uh, based on based on the work we did there together. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think there, you know, there are some structural things that have only become evident over time. One is, you know, the, the fintech has, you know, mostly uh, to date sort of structurally <laughs> attacked, if you will, the financial sector by unbundling it and picking it apart. Right. So we talked about lending club. We started with unsecured personal loans, SoFi with student loan refis, Venmo with, you know, P2P payments. Uh, Betterment and Wealthfront with robo advising, and everybody sort of attacked one piece of it and started to, um, as I said, sort of unbundle financial services. And we have a regulatory system that assumes, at least from a banking perspective, that you, you do a lot of things at the same time. So you take deposits and you make loans, right? And we also have a regulatory system, um, both public and sort of quasi private regulatory system, that assumes banks and only banks can do certain things like make payments. I think you've seen over the last few years some of the challenges and the frictions that that system imposes and people like Brian Brooks were trying to find a way forward by saying, hey, you know, a bank doesn't have to, you know, exercise all of its banking powers if they want to exercise some of their banking power. Somebody and, and, and somebody wants to do that within a regulated environment, we should allow that to occur within the federal banking system and provide an option for that. And I, I think I think the big issues going forward are going to be how we deal with that unbundling and unpacking of financial services on the one hand, and then the, the sort of rebundling, if you will. So how do all these separate financial services uh, work together um, and talk to each other? And I think there, uh, you know, Dodd-Frank included a provision that, you know, perhaps somewhat accidentally anticipated that with Section 1033, which basically said the consumers have the right um, to allow a third party to access their bank account information. Well, that's become incredibly important in a fintech world where you can connect your different financial uh, services applications so that they can talk to each other and share information. And that, that has facilitated an incredible amount of innovation over the last 10 years, um, sort of implicitly relying on 1033 because it's not actually been implemented by the Bureau, although the under the Trump administration, there was a, an AMPR. Um, and I, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, you know more initiatives like that will be taken. The final point I'll make, and it's just sort of a big one to drop at the end, but you know, part of what fintech is now enabling is really the embedding of financial services into you know other kinds of activities. So you know, it started with things like you know, you take an Uber ride or a Lyft ride, and you don't make a payment as a separate transaction. It's sort of embedded within that, and I think that kind of technology is increasingly common, um, and that starts to bump up pretty hard against you know the notions in the US around separation of banking and commerce. And it will be really interesting for me to see, to see where that goes. And it's sort of, uh, you know, just an interesting structural challenge. I don't think Dodd-Frank could have anticipated all of that uh, mm -hmm. to the extent, uh, to the extent it could have, we certainly weren't focused on it, but these are, these issues are real now. And I think that the big issues going forward are going to be, you know, ones around those two structural dimensions, the sort of unbundling of financial services on the one hand and the embedding of financial services into everyday commerce on the other. I agree. Well, listen, we could all, uh, I think, continue this conversation all afternoon and tell a lot of old uh, war stories. But I want to thank you for providing your insights today and participating in the, in the panel. Thank you very much.
Uh, we're going to now um, go to, um, I'm going to invite everybody to lounge uh, for those uh, viewers who just joined us. If you want to join us in the lounge uh, to network with the participants here, um, some of them are going to join us. So to join, uh, the digital team will send an alert, which will appear at the right uh, corner of your screen. You know, click on that alert to move to the lounge, and then click on one of the boxes that appear to uh, quote join a table. Um, you'll see it as you go through. You can also join the lounge by clicking lounge on the top of your screen. You'll need to turn your camera and mic back on uh, when you sit back uh, when you sit down at a table. We'll hope you join us. Our next panel will begin in about uh, 10 to 15 minutes.